of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And then Dana Birkenchow is Birkenchow, excuse me, is going to lead us in a prayer. Okay. Eternal Heavenly Father, our great sovereign God, we come before you as a thankful people, thankful that you have given us life, sustained us, enabled us to reach this moment. We ask that you would help us to use the time that you have given us wisely and faithfully. We ask for your blessing. On the food that we are about to receive, we ask for your blessing upon our activities this evening that we may glorify you. Please help us to renew old friendships and make new friendships and redouble our efforts to complete the mission that you have given us to accomplish. Pray these things in the name of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And then I'm calling this kind of a, a little bit of prayer and reflection. We have some people that we want to remember. And uh, uh, Representative Bunton would like to come up and, and, and share a couple of things. And I'm going to have you do this. Okay. Thank you, everybody, uh, for coming out tonight. I, I just want to share some really bad news. I'm sure that you've, uh, you've seen this this last week. And so I'd like to, to, to give a moment of silence for, uh, for conservatism in the Minnesota House that has died. As we've had so many conservatives actually decide they're going to run for the Senate. I think uh, we have maybe one or two uh, conservatives left in the House. Um, no, in all seriousness, um, uh, uh, we have we lost a great uh, champion of conservative values in Southern Minnesota with the death of, of Congressman Hagedorn. Um, and uh, I've been very impressed with his voting record, um, even voting against the big Trump uh, budget bills. And uh, it was is his death has, has left a big hole down in the first district. So we could just have a moment of silence for uh, for Congressman Hagedorn. Thank you. Thank you. And John, you want to come up and uh, we have some other people that have uh, we've lost this past year that John would like to. Have us help remember. Uh, yes, uh, I thought it was appropriate to uh, recognize some friends and supporters of LEA that have passed away within the last year. And if I'm leaving anybody out, somebody can help me uh, remember and others as well. So we have uh, Re Representative Dr. Richard Mulder, uh, who was a multiple time LEA honoree from the southwest corner of the state served in, in the legislature from 1995 to 2002. Uh, we have one of the co-founders of LEA, Daniel Pillow Sr. And also uh, Scott Coiner, our beloved husband of one of our guests tonight, who fell victim to uh, harmful managed care in Minnesota after contracting COVID. And if uh, we could all have a moment of silence for, for those people, uh, it would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now the food is ready. This is great news, right? Um, so they actually been ready. So uh, so uh, if, if the honorees could lead the way, uh, we'll start with with this table right here, and then I'm a left to right sort of a guy. So then we'll go to this table and then that table, and we'll start back over with this one. All right. Anybody, everybody confused? Okay, my job is done. <laughs> and then we'll be back in the after dinner and we will uh, do the election of officers. And uh, see uh, what we're ready to start with now is the election of officers. And Gordon Anderson is going to lead us through that. And, uh, and then we're going to have the vice president's remarks and then we'll do the awards. Well, this is our business meeting, our annual business meeting, and we have to usually take care of the election of officers. Our officers and uh, directors serve for two-year terms, and they're staggered, 
So we have uh, three who are not up for election this year. That's myself, Susan Erickson, if you want to stand. And Paul Sisko from Stillwater. And then we have five, you can see on the program, who's up for election. Uh, we, we didn't bring ballots today because we only have enough nominees to fill the available slots. We don't have extra people competing for slots. I want to say that if you want to become a board member, please let us know. And even if you're not a member, you can come to our meetings and serve as an advisor and just kind of work your way up. Oh, I'm, I read, I misread. Alex is the uh, continuing director. Alex, could you stand up? <laughs> Alex Redman is also our secretary. Uh, so, of the candidates who have been on the board and have volunteered to serve again are John Augustine, who you've already met, Dana Birkinshaw, our treasurer, Paul Sisto, who is uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, Ben Reekers, who's been our MC tonight. <laughs> Also, Don Lee, who is just recovering from surgery and is not here, he's been our president. Those five are up for re-election, and I'd like to recommend that we just do it by acclamation, that uh, everybody raise their hand if they approve of this slate of candidates. And, uh, okay, any objections? Hearing none, we've approved the slate, and I encourage anyone to come to our board meetings and serve in this, as an advisor and intern with us. <laughs> write some bill, help us write some bills. Yeah. Oh. Okay, moving right along here. Uh, John Oxy is our vice president, and he's he's. When I got roped into the LEA <laughs> by one Mary Amlaw, she made a point of saying, John Augustine is an incredible writer and researcher. And Mary steered me along about a couple of things, but that wasn't one of them. John is, a, is, is our incredible editor and writer on our and plays a super key role in producing these reports and he has a few comments to make as the vice president thank you very much for those kind words ben uh, so i am filling in tonight for our president don lee as far as the traditional remarks from the chair i have been going to some events uh, so some of you may have heard even a version of this uh, presentation uh, before so some of you may have heard this at uh, tea party meet, uh, meeting or uh, I was on uh, Mitch Bird's uh, and probably the Patriot radio program in December and I did a podcast uh, with uh, Jason Bradley and Andrew Richter so some of you may have heard this but for those who have not I will uh, uh, give you a little uh, synopsis of some observations came up with uh, doing a, analyzing the report uh, legislation from last year and preparing the report but before I do that I just wanted to point out once more time that uh, we were celebrating 50 years of existence this year so uh, everybody give a uh, hand for keeping the organization alive through thick and thin um, there, I did a little bit of research uh, just related to that in that I thought was kind of fascinating. So it was founded in 1972, incorporated in 1973. Uh, we, 
it's not been unusual for there to be not very many honorees. The very first year there was one honoree and it was a Democrat. So don't know if that's going to happen again or not, but we are going to partisan. And if they can, if they can uh, abide by our credo, they have a chance. So uh, the other very fascinating thing I found when I was doing the research is that one of the very first reports they did was 60 pages long, so we're known for a pretty exhaustive report, but we they scaled it back from the original. So, uh, but they had a list of people, of organizations. It says the in the 1973 report it says the following individuals who are members of the organizations indicated have concurred in the selection of the bills used to determine the legislators' vote rating. And we have organizations listed on here, like the Minnesota Conservative Union, uh, the Belt Prairie County Real Estate Taxpayers Association, the Minnesota Committee to Restore the Constitution, uh, the Young Americans for Freedom, the United Neighbors of Minnesota, the Anoka County Tea Party, the People's Reform Movement, the Constitution Party of Minnesota, the Chisago County Real Estate Taxpayers Association, the Citizens Coordinating Council for United Community Action, uh, the Brooklyn Park Taxpayers Club, the Ramsey County Tea Party, the Concerned Taxpayers of Minnesota, the Minnesota Citizens Legislative League, the, the Benton County Property Owners League, and not last but last but not least, the Legislative Evaluation Assembly. So, somewhere in our past, we knew we uh, knew how to do the uh, uh, plethora of uh, right-leaning. Uh, front groups <laughs> that, that, that could all sign on and organizations that could all sign on and uh, and work together and support uh, uh, conservative and libertarian uh, uh, legislators and legislation and uh, I don't know if we can revive that to some extent uh, I think we've lost a little bit of that uh, a lot of those organizations no longer exist I don't know how many organizations uh, from our side of the spectrum uh, produced a scorecard and reported last year, but I know some people in the audience that have supported us are also trying to get some scorecards going again as well. So, so it, we we know we know what it's like. So uh, best of luck. And uh, so I just wanted to uh, give you that perspective. I thought I thought that was uh, useful to do for their 50th uh, anniversary of existence. And so now that I just wanted. I uh, wanted to go on uh, a little bit with uh, some positive and negative developments in Minnesota state government. Kind of observed this this uh, past year, 2021. Uh, we didn't vote on these as the board, but that's just kind of what I came up with when I was making the presentation. So some of you in the audience might be thinking, uh, what positive developments were there last year? And uh, I had to think for a while. But I came up with three. So the uh, first one I came up with is that the court system is open again for both uh, criminal and civil cases. It was a travesty in 2020 that people could not petition the court for immediate relief from illegitimate actions by other branches of government. Just like ever, a lot of us experienced lockdowns, the courts got locked down as well, so it was pretty hard to challenge when that happens. So although the courts remain stocked with leftist appointees, uh, the Upper Midwest Law Center and other groups challenging government actions are getting students hurt now at various levels of the system. And appeals of lockdown orders and other mandates by those who dare to challenge them are winding their way through the system. And so, appeals of justice may not spin perfectly, but at least they are spinning again. So that's a positive development. Secondly, the state of emergency ended with the start of the fiscal year in July. Everybody give a hand for that, okay? So, uh, <laughs> It was 15 months and legislators were around most of the time, but uh, at least it finally got done. So there, and uh, so we, and there's, and we have to be on guard because there's really nothing other than the fear of a backlash uh, from a significant portion of the electorate at the next election that prevents the governor and the rubber stamping executive council from instituting a similar state of emergency at any time, at any time right now. So. Uh, so we can't just uh, rest on our loyals that it ended. We have to try to do something so that that doesn't happen again in the future. And then finally, 
uh, proud to say uh, that legislators from the 218 area code made it onto the list of er honorees this year. Uh, we, have, we have two in the audience, Representative Steve Green and Representative Pat Grassen. So we had a blip in 2011 from a senator who served two years up, up, up in northern Minnesota and then got redistricted out right away. But other than that, we haven't had any honorees from that region in almost 20 years. So uh, traditionally, it's only trailed the urban cores as far as the legislators wanting, you know, really trying to leverage as much subsidies and aid from the state as possible. You know, they think of the iron range and so forth. So, but uh, it seems we were hoping that it's part of a larger trend up north of people that are not only nominating but also electing more principled conservatives and constitutionally based legislators. So, congratulations. Uh, when it comes to uh, negative developments, I'll I'll shorten the list somewhat because I don't want people to uh, to, to get too despondent or depressed. I don't have meds for everybody here. So. Uh, first one I've got is uh, locally approved tax increases to finance capital improvement projects were exempted from statutory debt limits. So that's not very good when it comes to monitoring fiscal responsibility. And then kind of a byproduct of that, we, the same reasoning as more and more localities are, are petitioning for uh, local sales tax increases. And I don't know how often those actually get rejected, but it, it uh, seems to be growing government in that, in that sense. Uh, secondly, the legislature has accepted, or at least not reversed, the institutionalization of processes harmful to election integrity processes allegedly adopted due to the pandemic emergency. So in the uh, Ottawa State Government Bill this past year, we got the opportunity to increase surveillance and monitoring of the extra ballot drop boxes. And that's uh, being portrayed as a, you know, a big win for us. And uh, in reality, the left got something that we did fine without for over 160 years, institutionalized in the election process going forward. And it creates more opportunities for ballot stuffing mischief by unscrupulous actors. So they, you can you can uh, agree to monitoring, but you make that concession knowing that much is going to go unmonitored. You're not going to be able to see everything, and you won't be able to just physically won't be able to monitor everything. Just think about all the all all the camera footage for law enforcement and so forth. So it, it, if you don't need it, don't just agree to monitor it. Uh, third, um, we, got, we have the bipartisan headline pursuit of wrong-headed energy policies and, policies and regulations. So in a vain attempt to claim we are taking action to stop climate change, we are recklessly pushing certain types of renewable energy options that do not renew our baseload energy capacity. Uh, neglecting replacement of our most important power plants forces us to rely even more on out-of-state energy sources. It makes it more likely that we'll experience harmful periodic shortages in our power grid. Next, I would uh, uh, like to highlight the ever greater submission of the entire legislative body to the decision of a few legislative leaders and the governor negotiated pri privately behind closed doors. Only 31 bills got floor votes in the 2021 regular legislative session. Continuing a downward trend from the hundreds voted on per year not long ago. And we have somebody in the audience tonight that served in the time, just about the time the LEA started in the legislature, uh, uh, Tad Jew. I'm wondering if you could tell us about how many bills uh, got floor votes in the first years you were in the legislature. Well, my guess would be uh, 500. Well, I guess I think that's a conservative estimate. I think it was actually closer to a thousand, but, but that gives you a, a sense for how all of these laws are getting combined into fewer and fewer bills, which is not good for accountability. Um, so even, and, and those 31 bills don't even cover most of the budget. Most of the budget was passed in an even smaller number of uh, constitutional multi-subject omnibus bills in the June special session. And a byproduct or, or uh, further evidence of the governor's increasing ability to dictate legislation 
uh, relates to his veto power. So governors Dayton and Pulani each made around 90 full vetoes, or so, and also some line-item vetoes during their eight years in office. Governor Ventura had 33 full vetoes in four years, and Governor Carlson, certainly not a conservative, had oh, around 120 in eight years. Anyone want to guess how many vetoes Governor Walls has made since he became governor? No. That is correct, zero. That is a dramatic departure from the past. And, and it's, uh, it's showing how much he can dictate the terms of legislation. And so we've got to get back to a balance of power. Obviously it's hard to do during the state of emergency, but we've got to do whatever we can to get back to that. Um, since uh, physical meetings and access to legislative offices are still in many cases restricted, so if ordinary constituents' ability to participate in the legislative process wasn't always great before the pandemic, it became much worse when they started locking down the uh, state office building and even, even the uh, uh, lobbyists and media needed, media needed key card access, uh, approval from the legislators to get in. So, so you get this echo chamber where, where you're not getting outside input and uh, it's not just from the outside, it's not just from, from us citizens here in the audience, but it's also internally. Uh, the, the restrictions and, and, and the reduction of physical meetings. There's, I was at an event in early December where a freshman legislator got up and spoke and said that he had yet to meet over half of the freshman legislators that he was elected with in person. And that's, you know, going on uh, a year after being uh, first to orientation. So uh, that, that, when that happens, you know, they, if you people from legislators from other parties or other parts of the state can't get together and meet in person to, you know, go over possible legislation, what's the alternative? Everything just gets handed down uh, from the leadership. And so you, then why do we have 201 legislators if that's the case? So, uh, so we want to we get uh, back to having uh, authentic uh, meeting opportunities as soon as possible. I think uh, Representative Nash is trying to jumpstart that with his uh, constituent service office hours in the Capitol might shame, uh, might shame the House into uh, leadership into getting back on, on that path, hopefully. Uh, seventh here, I'll go with uh, uh, redistricting. So, so redistricting uh, is not so much the results of the redistricting, it's the process in terms of, it's very dysfunctional in terms of trying to just uh, have uh, citizen participation in, in, in the government at this point. Um, there's been all kinds of maneuvering uh, for various uh, legislators uh, trying to figure out who's going to run and in which free district to district and which senate district and so forth but in many cases uh you know the uh, conventions happen in just a few days after the redistricted lines and after precinct caucuses so if, if you were just uh concerned about your uh legislator in your area and were thinking about challenging running you had to go to precinct caucus not knowing whether you were going to be able to live in the district of the person you were trying to challenge and the people you were at caucus with, you didn't even know if, which ones you needed to organize in order to mount any kind of challenge. So it really puts challenges behind the eight ball when, in that type of system. And we've got to do something. There, there, there's, a, there's a few different things that could be done, but we've got to do something uh, so that doesn't happen again the next time around that, that uh, we get we get uh, redistricted lines before before the caucuses and conventions go into play. Uh, another very negative development is that they, we have a continued destructive presence of Minnesota's power-loving Fauci Craig Health Commissioner Jan Malcolm in our government. You know, her confirmation really should have been rejected by the Senate no later than June of 2020. They had the special session where the Democrats were uh, desperate to pass policing reforms, we should have been just as insistent on 
getting our, our uh, health freedom decisions back and sending a message. Um, you know, it's easy to forget. They kind of count on you forgetting these tyrants. They kind of count on you forgetting after a year or two all the, all the junk that they did. But, you know, if you go back to the summer of 2020, we had 10-person uh, gathering limits on churches regardless, regardless of building capacity. We have all kinds of restricted access to medic, medical care deemed non-essential delaying diagnoses. Onerous restrictions on outdoor graduation ceremonies. So, and then, and then uh, early the holiday season 2020, we had uh, indoor dining prohibitions and, and family gathering restrictions during the winter in 2020. So uh, even now we've got the, uh, we're using so many much public advertising dollars to push for more acceptance uh, to younger and younger ages of these experimental vaccines while simultaneously suppressing access to cheap and effective treatment options. It's hurting all of us. And they're justifying racial discrimination in treatment as well. So, so I mean, we, that, that's a very negative development. I don't really understand why it's, why we're still under that reign, to be honest with you. And then finally, and this was something that we really noticed as a, as a group in, uh, two th and when, while we were doing the research for the 2021 report, this proliferation of a racial, ethnic, and activist spoil system of appropriations. In 2020, the Minnesota House passed a resolution to insert race-based criteria into future bills. Though it didn't pass the Senate, the House implemented it for their bills last year with the support of the government. And ironically, this expanded racism is supposed to address embedded historical and structural racism. It's showing up in policies stuffed into omnibus bills. One example is a new statute that effectively creates quota requirements for midwives and doulas it's in, in the Omnibus Health and Human Services Bill, which is page 11 of our report this year. So, uh, it's also increasingly prevalent in many of the main budget bills, housing, higher education, public safety, even agriculture. The allocation of and even eligibility for government funds, whether directly or indirectly through nonprofit vendors, is not tied to economic need or health conditions, but rather to racial and ethnic group status. And that kind of spoil system, which is kind of the antithesis of the one Minnesota slogan that we hear about, uh, assimilation and unity essential for building functional local communities is devalued because it jeopardizes the status based on group identification. It puts a major strain on public safety and other services we expect the local governments to address. And the end, end result of an obsessive approach on uh, engineering equity of equal group outcomes is that individuals are being denied equal treatment under the law, even if officials bother to follow the law in the first place. And uh, so, we, because we noticed that more, more than ever this past year, uh, we kind of chose uh, something related to that theme for the banquet. And uh, the keynote speaker was unable to make it tonight due to the weather. But we're going to hold a discussion, as you see in the program here, on, on how we can try to derail the racial ethnic spoil system and legislation from a panel of experts, the honorees that we have here tonight. So we'll be doing that uh, shortly after the awards presentation. And uh, we have extra reports here tonight if anyone wants to buy, it. buy a whole bunch of them. They can if they want just individual copies, they can just take them with them, I guess. But uh, thanks uh, so much for uh, coming out in, uh, in this uh, uh, inclement weather, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you.
Okay, now we're back on. Okay, set. I can shoot pool without glasses, but I gotta have glasses to read. Um, especially fine print. Um, we're on to the award session, and uh, we are, we've designated someone to present to each one of the honorees, and up first uh, is Representative Gaskowski, and Gordon Anderson is going to present his award. first time we've been up here. I'm very pleased that as we were talking before this is the tenth award you've won. Steve, Steve is from District 21B. He was first elected in 2007 and every year he didn't win an award he has won honorable mention and sometimes at least twice he was the only one who got an honorable mention. So he's a person that has been working very much consistent with our credo. And uh, in the 92nd legislature, he's been chief author of 19 bills. I, maybe you've put in more by now. But uh, I would like to mention a couple that show how he's concerned about representing citizens rather than elites and lobbyists. And uh, first one, House File 0211, was photo ID required with voting. <laughs> House File 0579, firearms use in self-defense, clarified and expanded. House File 2491, employees granted the right to work without being a union member. House file 2693, lobbyists must file a conflict of interest statement. Yeah. All of these things I think are th certainly things I think we should be doing and I'm so happy to see you doing and I'm happy to present you this award. Well, thank you, Gordon. Thank you, everybody. It's it's an honor to be here before you, and and uh, it's humbling to be before all these conservatives in the room, and to be recognized with some colleagues that are our top-notch colleagues and friends. Um, we certainly have our challenges in the legislature, but we also have op times of opportunity. Uh, I think that. Um, it was brought out, um, John brought out earlier some of the things that, that we had through this pandemic. And I remember, you know, when the pandemic started, you know, the, the governor came out and said, there's 74,000 people that are gonna die if we don't do this stuff. Remember that, Susan? Oh, yeah. 74,000. And then if we do do this, it's only gonna be 50,000 that die. And so people were afraid and the, told everybody to stay home for two weeks or however long that was. Um, that was in February or March of uh, 2000, March. March of 2020, or 2020, yes. Um, I authored the first resolution to end the peacetime emergency in April of 2020. And there are other members of my caucus and of the other caucus that uh, soon did the same thing. Uh, and actually even, it took probably a full year for kind of maybe some of the maybe establishment or mainstream Republicans to start doing it. it. It was interesting to watch that those of us, I think, that were driven for freedom and knew that this wasn't right, were willing to do that in the face of all the fear of the, of, of the other members and of the culture. And it was, it was a challenging thing to do, but it was the right thing to do. And we did it. And we started the conversation, broke through the ice, and encouraged our, our uh, colleagues to come along. So it's that type of love of our state and our country and our founding fathers and our founding documents and the meaning behind them and the liberty that God gave us, I think that drives us all. Thank you.
you know, speaking about that forecast, that 74,000 forecast, uh, Peggy Scott, Representative Peggy Scott, who I'm the treasurer for, she uh, she said, then I think I think these numbers don't make sense. And I, so she let me kind of brought me in kind of behind the scenes and I looked at it a little bit and said, well, this is got to be. I mean, anybody who's programmed anything would see flaws in, in what they've got going on here. And so I wrote up some notes and I sent it in, sent it, sent it to her by email. And she was in some meeting with a handful of people and was still friends, I think, was friends around the table. <coughs> and I was on a speaker call and she says, uh, well, I got to this one part and you've got SWAG. And and what 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 is SWAG? What's what what's swag? And we said, oh, I'm glad you asked because I thought everybody knew that one. A scientific wild ass guess. <laughs> <laughs> and she said, Boy, I'm glad I called you before I went into the meeting. <laughs> um the next person up, um, let's see, Susan Erickson is going to do Representative Kirk Sarah. Thank you, Mr. I'm honored to present this award to a representative who actually works and fights for us, all while following the Constitution. We need many more leaders like him. I was really touched, I was really touched to learn that he sends dozens of congratulation cards every month to brand new parents in his district to celebrate the sanctity of life. He's also a very snappy dresser. <laughs> Please welcome Representative Eric Lucero, who has some big news to share. Well, thank you, everybody. I wasn't expecting to talk about this tonight, but the but I this is a great group to, to discuss it with. So with the redistricting, there was an open Senate district in my area, and I decided to throw my hat in for state senate. Can I mention you? No, yeah, no. Take my thunder. No, you go ahead and mention no. whoever you want to mention. Okay, well, you know what's so great, though, is it is an honor to serve in the Minnesota House of Representatives. It is even greater honor to stand for the values and priorities of the, excuse me, the Constitution. And I serve with a great number here tonight in the House. But it's so fun to know that there's at least one, two, three of us here that are going to be running for Senate. And there are at least two that are not here tonight that are also constitutional, conservatively oriented, who are going to be running for the Senate. So there's at least five of us. And the awesome part is, in the House, there's 134 members, right? In the Senate, there's half as many. Maybe no more 66 to 0 votes. Like yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly right. No more 67 to 0 or 66 to 0 votes. But there are 67 senators. So when you have potentially up to five conservatives becoming senators, that is an incredible power in persuading those in the conversations. And I truly believe that it, it is very hard. In fact, part of the discussion tonight at our table was, when you were that lone voice on an issue, each and every one of us in our spheres, in our daily lives, we face challenges, right? And I'm sure in our, if we think back over the past years, some point in our history, we've had to stand for something. It may not be political at all, but whatever the choice, it may be, if you're the only one in a group of people with a particular opinion, it is not easy to stand alone, right? It's not easy. Courage is contagious. And so while the, as was just mentioned, 66, 67 to zero votes, I truly believe there are a handful of people in the Senate right now that are very conservative. But it's not easy when you're bullied. And so if you add five, up to five more in there, right, that might result in seven to 10 strong constitutional votes in the Senate, out of a total of 67 votes. So the point is, 
up to five more joining those that are there now, the incumbents, 10 votes is huge out of a total of 67. And when the majority might simply be 35, 36, 37 votes, 10 out of a theoretical 37 is incredible and has incredible influence. And so I'm really looking forward to serving in the Senate. And I know I've already probably chewed up my time, but the one thing I was gonna mention was not this, but I wanted to mention in my remarks, if, do I have two more minutes? Is that okay? Okay. You get the mic. So that, when I say two minutes, that means like 20. So, by the way, I'm very impressed with, with John's speech up here. And what really impresses me is I really study the art of public speaking. And words, we in Rush Limbaugh, words mean things, right? And I was just very impressed, just listening, sitting here listening to John, and the way he's able to construct these arguments, what just, when you're trying to persuade hearts and minds, and you, you put together a series of words, and the way you were able to articulate some of these very incredibly dangerous to our republic, uh, the, the path that we're on, uh, I really much appreciate that. But one of the things that he mentioned was the court system, and that sparked what I wanted to say. We know that our constitutional republic is built on an understanding that human personalities have a tendency, human history demonstrates, the desire, the human desire to control other people, right, to control other lives. Our founding fathers understood that. So they architected our great republic with these checks and balances to try to slow down and stop that. But even our founding fathers recognized, right, the tendency to creep and to control. But with that system of checks and balances throughout our constitutional system, we are very familiar with the checks and balances of the legislative branch over the executive branch. And what, what is that check? The power of the purse, right? We know the check that the executive branch has over the legislative branch, and what is that? The veto, right? We're very familiar with that. We're very familiar with the judicial branch's check over the executive and legislative branch, and what do we call that? Ruling things unconstitutional, right? But what's the check that we either little to zero ever hear about? And that is the legislative branch's check over the judicial branch. Yeah. And what is that? Impeachment. Because impeachment is rarely ever exercised at the national or state level, we've seen decades now of what the product is. And that is the judicial branch, because they're so bold that they're not going to be held accountable by the legislative branch. They're operating well outside their constitutional boundaries. We see a judicial branch run amok with rulings that are just, it's unbelievable how far they've gone in some rulings. And so anyway, I don't have the time to give the background, but I think some in this room are aware that I was the co-plaintiff that sued Secretary of State Simon when, in, in regards to the consent decree that usurped the legislative branch's plenary authority that the United States Constitution grants to the, the, ver the 50 states, the various states, to unilaterally write election law, right? Secretary of State Simon usurped that. I can't give the background for that. But we won in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, in a two-to-one ruling, eviscerated Secretary of State Simon. Eviscerated him. How many by, have read that opinion? And you're out of bed, okay, more hands than I thought. Right? And those who've read it, I think you would agree. Just eviscerate, tore him apart. So based on that, and based on what I just said about the, the legislative branch, uh, the check and balance over the judicial branch, I chief authored Articles of Impeachment Against Secretary of State Simon, and I'm sure very few have heard of that because the media, the corporate media has no interest in, in getting that information out. But in addition to that, I also am the chief author of the Articles of Impeachment against the district judge uh, in Minnesota here, Sarah Grueling, who signed off on that consent decree. Well, thank you. So the Democrat majority in the House is not going to let those, those Articles of Impeachment ever see the, the light of day because they have to originate in the House. But Next session, when we are in the majority, now the articles of impeachment against Secretary of State Simon won't mean anything because he won't have been reelected, right? But Judge Sherry Grueling will still be there. And I plan to, well, I guess I'll, I'll be in the Senate. I'll be in the Senate. I guess I'll have to delegate that to somebody else. 
Yeah, Matt Grossel. I'll to delegate that, and those articles of impeachment against that judge should absolutely move forward in the Republican majority to kick that judge out. So thank you, everybody. Great group, and I'm sincerely humbled and appreciate it. I think he could probably be a filibuster player if he had to. He has been. He has been from time to time. How about a governor? <laughs> okay. Let's see. So, Representative Beckman is not here tonight, um, and nor is uh, Representative Mortensen. We did have someone that was going to say something. About Some, the, someone wanted to say something in, in, for, 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 for Shane. For Shane? Yes. For you, you can have the mic. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Well, Shane, this is for you. I'm sorry you're not here tonight. Um, I've had the honor of knowing many representatives. They're wonderful people, but Shane, I've gotten to know better. He and I, when I first started working on his campaign, he was good. And then after we had uh, the waltz shut everything down, and then the pork producers stopped coming and producing pork, and many farmers were just killing and burying their pigs because they didn't have anybody to uh, process them and so Shane and I together started a save the pigs. We didn't <laughs> save a single pig but there are hundreds of pigs that are now in people's freezers instead of in you know in the ground having been buried. So we had a lot of fun with that and then one thing that has changed my life more than anything is Shane has gotten extremely involved with what's going on in the medical field. Um, he has spent I, I don't want even I, I don't even know how many hundreds of hours he has talked to individual people, his own constituents and people from across the state and across the nation, where they will call him and they will say, Shane, I'm sick with COVID, what do I do? And he has connections with uh, Dr. Peter McCullough, his assistant, and Shane has lined up with more people, their ability to get the medicines that they need that hospitals will not give. And there's somebody else here tonight that I would like her to come up. Uh, I did not know this person until a certain Wednesday afternoon. Shane says, Marge, you have to meet with this lady um, because tomorrow they're going to kill her husband. And so Annie Quiner came to my office because Shane said to Annie, you need to come to Marge. And then we were, we, I've never done, I spent the first hour trying to find another attorney who knew what they were doing couldn't and so we stumbled through together we got a temporary restraining order stopping mercy hospital from pulling the plug on your husband and that was the connection shane mecklin made do you want to say anything about shane's impact on your life um yeah and i also want to say something about eric what you just said because there is power in one voice <laughs> when 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 uh when Shane contacted me, he said, you know, you need to, you know, they basically go on social media with this. And my thing was, I don't want to be knowing anybody who I am. <laughs> and he said, they're going to kill your husband if, if you don't. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it. Whatever it takes to save his life, you know. And I can't tell you the hours and the time that Shane spent behind the scenes helping me to try to, to rescue my husband out of the hospital. And we did it. We did it. It was a literal miracle. And I can also say Shane and Senator Bruce Anderson were huge behind the scenes. Shane was phenomenal. That's all I can say. I, to get to know him, he's a unique guy. He's a great guy, you know that? And I am proud that he is our state representative. So, And I also want to say that, you know, <laughs> When I went on to Stu Peters, I was like, I'm just nobody, you know? And I mean, you guys are somebody, you guys are powerful people. And it, for me to go on there and Stu Peters explode this all over social media, you know, there is, there, and you're saying, you know, that how you, you know, are running for Senate, you know, and how the majority is so very few, but man, you guys have such a powerful voice that, when I share my story, I have hundreds of people from all over this country, even up to frontline lawyers, and 
and people that were medically have families that were medically murdered in hospitals including Mercy Hospital and I can't tell you the numbers of people that contacted me and people said you know what thank you for sharing your story because now I know why my family members were killed in these hospitals because of their protocols and standard of care and it raised awareness across the whole United States I can't even begin to tell you where to start with all of that but it was huge and so when people become aware of your voices and what your, your, your story is, you guys have a story to tell. And your stories are all very powerful. That's all, that's all I want to say. Uh, when it's from the heart, it really makes a difference. That's for sure. Um, our next uh, award is uh, is for Representative Munson and uh, Paul Susco. Susco, yes. is going to present. It. Thank you. Well, uh, it's a pleasure to recognize Minnesota House Representative Jeremy Munson. Uh, you were elected in 2018, as I understand it, in a special election, and then handily won re-election in the last general election. Um, he represents District 23B in southern Minnesota. Uh, Representative Munson has been active in a huge number of areas in the House, including authoring or co-authoring of bills that support Minnesotans' Second Amendment right to possess a firearm for personal protection. Uh, he favors actions related to the responsible dispensation of budgetary surplus dollars, as I understand it, and in particular, uh, promoting the return of some of those to taxpayers. What an idea. <laughs> like that one. Um, he's an outspoken advocate of free and fair elections and supports measures aimed at curbing uh, what you might call creeping bureaucratization and corruption of our election procedures. And so efforts to thwart the use of tactics like consent decrees and the um, proliferation of irresponsible, unverifiable voting, I think we all support. Um, and hope that you're successful with it. Um, Mr. Munson has also in, uh, introduced legislation to hold parties accountable for negative health consequences that may arise from mandated vaccination. <laughs> and this, this relates also uh, to being a proponent of the Never Again Bill, is it, is it called that at this point? which would prevent um, executive overreach and unconstitutional actions uh, under emergency powers by, by actually limiting that uh, to natural disasters, right? Um, and I like your continued fight to bring uh, a return of marketplace dynamics to the healthcare system. In particular, initiatives to reconnect patients directly with providers uh, from an economic standpoint, giving them the care options and financial incentives uh, to do things differently. And somebody's got to reel that whole system in at some point. So I wish you luck with that. Uh, finally, I, I see that recently you've been engaged in promoting a law to limit the state's ability to directly interact with minors. Um, presumably for propagandistic or other nefarious purposes. Uh, and that, that, that sounds like a good bill. And other initiatives to rein in lobbying influence, which all help to uh, drain the collective swamp. Uh, well, I, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, Representative Munson has an interest in all things germane to the well-being of Minnesotans. Yeah. And that's a great podcast, by the way. Well, I'll take the COVID wrapper out here. So <laughs> all right, here, I'll, I'll shake your head and we'll get the picture. Oh, I didn't get a picture. Okay.
Well, I, I think I said this last year. Um, you know you won a, uh, a award for being fiscally conservative when the award is this small. <laughs> but I really appreciate it. Um, and this is really special. Uh, this award is extremely special because this is going to be my last LEA award. Um, I'm going to cry. So I announced that I'm, I'm no longer running for re-election in the Minnesota House. I was elected four years ago this week. Actually, yesterday I was four years ago yesterday I was sworn in in a special election the very first day of session, and came into the majority. Served one session in the majority, had no training, no orientation, and uh, started writing legislation that I found out quickly in the price transparency stuff in healthcare that the lobbyists don't like. This is my introduction and how it works in St. Paul. You write a bill, and the lobbyists don't like it. They just tell the speaker uh, or the you know, majority leader of your party that uh, we gave you a bunch of money, we don't want a hearing on that bill. Well, the speaker chooses the chairs of the committee, so the, they just tell the chairs, you're not hearing this bill, and they can kill bills. And the really, really good bills that would benefit your constituents, bring free markets, rein in government, they won't get a hearing because the lobbyists and the special interest groups will just pay to kill the bills. And this is a frustration of mine. I went to, to St. Paul to fight for free markets and health care because that's what Obamacare dragged me into politics. But it's the lobbyists and special interest groups that really became my target. And so then I started working on uh, transparency in government and kind of exposing what's going on in the legislature, bringing, you know, live streaming the floor sessions and the committee hearings on Facebook and then commenting on the floor with my laptop. And people would say, what is this vote? This is a vote to suspend the rules to take up this bill because it's an emergency when it's not. But you know, when people would see all the votes and they're getting involved, and all of a sudden I'm having five or six hundred people watching a live stream on the on the house floor um, and telling them what all this means. And then we introduced legislation to prohibit legislators from being employed by a lobbying firm <laughs> or a company whose sole purpose it is to lobby government. We actually have legislators who own or are the heads of companies who get paid to get stuff in the omnibus bill. There's a lot of ethical reforms we need in the legislature. Um, and then on the election side, I just want to talk about one bill that was really important to me. I don't know we'll get it through. But if you have an incumbent, and we talked earlier on how hard it is to run against an incumbent. If an incumbent files for re-election, gets the endorsement, files for re-election, and then on the last minute of the, of the last day of the filing period, their chosen successor comes in and files for office, and the, and the, filing, period closes, the filing period closes. The next day, the legislator takes his name off there, and in a deeply red or deeply blue district, that legislator has just handed their seat to a chosen successor. Now, doesn't that upset you? You're active in a district, you're like, well, I'd love to run as soon as Bob retires. And then all of a sudden, Bob's off. You find out he's pulled his name off. The filing period's closed. Only one person can be on the ballot, or be on that party. There's no primary. Uh, it's done. I wrote a bill to stop that. My bill says if an incumbent removes their name, first of all, the incumbent must file in the first week, not on the second week. But if they take their name off, there's an automatic open filing period, special filing period for just non-incumbents. That, that's a good bill. And I want to bring that up on the floor as an amendment because it impacts nobody but the people in that room. But that is one thing we can do to, change, to drain the swamp. And that little shenanigan that I just explained happened multiple times in the last election. Multiple times. On our side, especially. That, that is, that's bad behavior by legislators. We need to reform that. So, my focus was on transparency and exposing the, the legislature and bad shenanigans and draining the swamp. There's a lot of stuff we can do to reform government, and I hope we can do, you know, push that forward. I would love to, to get rid of multi-subject omnibus bills, get back to having a thousand votes on the floor, that would be great. Um, and uh, until then, I'm going to step out of the legislature and uh, throw tomatoes with the rest of you. So I'm looking forward to it, and, and, and uh, working on making sure that we have a real conservative elected to the first congressional district down where I'm at. So that'll be my focus. So thank you everybody for the award, and thanks for participating and supporting LEA.
Thank you. Uh, next up, Dana is going to, uh, Dana Birkinshaw is going to uh, present Representative Green with his I don't, award. I don't know if he knows that. Oh, well, <laughs> let's see how good he is on his feet. <laughs> you, that's fine. Are you, I can, I can, you, okay. you, you, you want to do it? Oh, yeah. So, Representative Green, one of our great northern hopes. <laughs> Welcome to the LA Banquet. In uh, many years uh, that I've been involved with the LA Board, there's generally been two patterns we've seen when it comes to uh, legislators' ratings. They've either been like, rock solid year after year after year, or in the longer they serve, uh, kind of it, they, 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 it diminishes a little bit. And uh, you broke the mold, and you've gotten better. <laughs> you, you, and uh, you just narrowly missed uh, getting an award uh, last year, uh, your honorable mention. And uh, this year, you're at uh, 92%, even though we grade a little bit on a, on a curve, I think that's pretty much gonna get you an award almost every year. So uh, uh, welcome to the LEA uh, Honorees List, uh, Representative Green. Thank you. Um, I know I sit at the table for the honorees and I, I'm always uncomfortable with that because uh, as a servant, uh, I'm the one who should be uh, happy to be sitting with the honorees out here. I, uh, I'm not a good speaker, like some are, so I don't speak too much. But I do like that when I do say, uh, say something, uh, I like to be straight to the point. I expect people to listen, and uh, maybe that comes from my background, or maybe because I ran a business for so long. But when I came to the legislature, uh, one of the things that they wanted you to do was pass bills right away. And a lot of people believe that your job as a legislator is to pass bills, but for me, it's not. For me, my job as a legislator is to pay the bills, uh, follow the Constitution, and get out of there before we do too much damage. <laughs> and, and I found out uh, very quickly that uh, the job that I thought was going to end in May doesn't end. <laughs> and, but, but I will say this, I, I'm the father of six children, great children, and I have 15 grandkids. And, and one, of the, one of the reasons I ran in the first place was on a pro-life issue, where uh, the senator, or the representative at the time, uh, who always claimed to be pro-life, was taking votes for embryonic stem cell research, and that pushed me over the edge to run, and, and uh, it was a long, long time ago, but here I am. But one of the things that most people don't know and don't realize is, is that there's a lot of uh, bills these guys carry and other people carry that are uh, very much in the limelight and, and they're, they're easy to push, they're uh, attention getters because everybody sees them. But for me, one of the things that, I, that I've always felt was, was wrong, especially in Minnesota, like California, is that first thing is we have way too many laws. The second thing is we have agencies that are so much out of control and they're going after our private pro your private property rights yeah. every day. Right. And we've got a stack of law books this high. So when someone says how many laws have you passed, I haven't passed very many, how many laws do you want? But we have a stack this high of rules. And the rules that are made by agencies apart from any elected official except for the governor who signs them because they're his commissioners. And, and there's, for you, there's no distinguishing between the law and the rule. And in my opinion, they're unconstitutional. And so if you look at the bills that I've tried to pass and, and found out very quickly that it's way easier to pass a horrible bill than it is to get rid of a horrible bill, that's what they are. I think this year I probably, somewhere between 30 and 50 bills trying to go after agencies, and that's what my policies have been. 
Now, during the pandemic, I did have uh, the bill to uh, put the to change the governor's uh, authority for emergency powers and put it into the constitution that we're going to limit these powers. Because it's nice to have a bill that says we're gonna take these powers away, but the problem in Minnesota is we like to flip. And the next time we flip, the governor can get those powers back in a heartbeat. But if we put that on, onto a constitutional amendment that says the governor has just a few days, I put in seven in mind, just in case it's the middle of summer and and the legislature's away, we need a few days because one day we're going to have a good governor and he may have to use those. And after that, the only way they can continue is if both bodies agree to extend them. And if they don't, they're gone. Somewhere along the line, and I, and I, don't, I don't remember what year it was, they flipped that because it used to be that way. And they flipped it and, and changed it to, to now the governor can institute those powers, and if you don't have both House and Senate to take those powers away, he can keep extending them for every 30 days. And it's completely backwards. And, and I never knew that, because why would I? I mean, I, I, don't, I, I didn't study to find out if you get a corrupt governor, what's he gonna do if he takes emergency powers? So I'm not gonna talk much longer, but I will tell you this. We're in bad shape in this country right now. And it's not just because of Joe Biden. I mean, he's flipped us over the edge big time, and there's no question about that. But this has been creeping in for a very long time. And if there's anything good that comes of it, I hope it's that people are waking up and that we need to go after the, gov the government's powers. Limited government is what we need. <laughs> and if you think that that's too hard to get, I always remind people that a couple hundred and plus years ago, 56 men sat in an old tavern somewhere and signed their name to a document that, that basically said, if we get caught, you can hang us. And some of them were hung because they said, we're not gonna follow the king. Well, we got some things worse than the king coming at us now and we have to stand up and fight. And, and it's time to be bold in that. But thank you for this award and thank you for having me. Yeah, for not being a speaker. <laughs> no, that was, that was good. I, I, I really like, especially the point in about the middle of your talk about how we need to take those, we need to take those uh, responsibilities out of the government, not leave them there and hope that we'll be, you know, have the right people involved so that they can execute bad laws against us because you know, it's going to go back and forth. Bad laws, bad expansion of government needs to be taken out of the government, not, well, it'll be great when we're in charge and we can use them. So that's one of the points that I thought I heard you say. Hopefully that was correct. Uh, I am uh, going to give the uh, the last, uh, least, well, not like least, or that, uh, to Representative Grossel. So I, uh, I looked, looked up uh, in preparation of this a little bit to see what, see what uh, Representative Council's background was in law enforcement. And I thought, well, thank you for your service, first of all. And then uh, one of the things, it sounded an awful like, lot like common sense, like uh, do the people's business, don't waste their money. But I thought one of those important things one of the important things that I picked up in, in doing a little research was your comment that um, we're ready to blame racism for every problem that we have in the world. And I thought your comment that whether there's police reform to be done, and surely there are some things that can always make better. And you said, and you said it with confidence, that racism on the force is not the problem. And I, I, I think people need to say that clearly and without hesitation and I was you know, glad to hear you say that and I hope more people say that because uh, because it's wrong and we're we're not going to fix the the racism that we do have in this country with more racism and so that just seems like uh, I don't know who thinks that's a good idea 
but it's not going to work, it hasn't worked, and they've been trying it for 50 years at some level, and it's a bad idea. Anyway, congratulations. Thank you. Very, very happy to be here. And uh, we'll keep talking about the share. Maybe you're not a speaker like uh, you know, like your your, your, your co-member up there in Fenn District Two. I'm definitely definitely not as chatty as the rest of them. <laughs> <laughs> though though they uh, started to say I, I I would tell them I'll make this short and everybody roll their eyes. <laughs> so once you get rolling, yeah, I mean things start things start coming forward, and you made a very good point. Uh, racism uh, in, uh, among the law enforcement in our state, that's not the problem. Really, really, uh, racism is a good idea that uh, used by the socialists. Racism is what they use, uh, economic status is what they use, and among, among many other things, to drive people apart, to drive a wedge between citizens. And that is, is what we see in front of us today. That's right. That is what we see all around the state, all around this country. I made a comment, uh, I, I, I made a post uh, when all of the riots kicked off after, after the George Floyd incident. I made a comment, uh, I put a post out there to let people know that this is not driven by this man's death. This is an agenda that has been just started. They used his death as a springboard to attack this republic. Yep. Plain and simple. And I know I know that uh, I know that my comments were were a direct shot to the socialist movement because the head of the DFL in the state of Minnesota contacted my leadership and said I needed to be censured in public. <laughs> so I told I told my leadership, well good luck with that. <laughs> I said, I guess I, I guess I, I guess I smacked him right between the eyes, didn't I? <laughs> so coming from a law enforcement background, uh, I don't pull any punches. I, I give two people straight. There's no use in trying to sugarcoat things because that doesn't work. When people come to me and ask for help, I tell them whether I can help them or not. I make sure that when they leave my office, they leave knowing what's coming. And when uh, when I started uh, when I when I first got recruited, I asked the uh, representative who was retiring, uh, "How far down the how far down the food chain did you have to go to find me?" <laughs> and he chuckled. He just chuckled. He said, "Well, a, a person of uh, good repute uh, gave me your name, and he said you would be a, I'd be a stand-up guy to run for this office." I told him, "Geez." I've been a SWAT cop, a patrol deputy, and an undercover narcotics agent. I said, I hope you don't think I'm going to be nice and sugar coat things for you. <laughs> he said, I think that's what we need. So uh, my priorities have been uh, working on the uh, public safety and the civil law committees. And right now I've been working on trying to uh, address a, a very, a, a very big, a very big, injustice that has been left to go for years and that is to increase penalties for the crime of, of manufacturing for, for producing for distributing and for possession of child rape and torture uh, imagery and, and videos and I forget which one of the guys mentioned it earlier about uh, you bring a, a good piece of legislation, something that you think is, this is bipartisan, this, this, this can't have any issues. But I've been fighting for going on six years now to get this piece of legislation across the finish line. As of, as of late, uh, because I, I decided, you know, I'm done playing political games with people, I'm done having people take uh, something that I, I don't think is a really good piece of legislation, but it's a start and have them take even more away from it. So I said, all right, I'm just gonna feed you what I, what I think should, should be done. And I'm still working on getting a hearing in both the House and the Senate to increase these penalties against these people who are preying on their children and to take them off the street. 
So uh, there's a really good, there's a really good uh, video, Child Protection League of Minnesota has come alongside to help me. Uh, there's a really good video I'd like people to watch and, and pass it on to uh, other people. It's, it's called, uh, the documentary is called Shattered. And it gives you a very good picture of how much, uh, how much this has been left go for far too long. These kids, their voices aren't being heard. Their cries for help aren't being heard. Their cries for justice aren't being heard. And the people on the front lines, uh, officers and agents, their calls for help aren't being heard because they're trying to get justice for these kids and hold these predators accountable and get them off the street. And our state statute isn't doing it. So, you know, I look forward to, uh, I look forward to, uh, you know, hopefully if, when we take the majority back in the house, I'm hoping to grab a gavel. I planted a couple seeds, so we'll see what comes because, you know, I, I've told them that uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat things. I'm going to do what I know to be right. And if people don't like that, well, that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's too bad. I'm going to keep fighting for what's right. You got it? Oh. I got one. Oh, you already got it? I got one, but I can take another one just because. <laughs> Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Now, we are going to ask all of our, um, all of our honorees to come up and we've got your names uh, on one of these two tables and we're going to have a little panel discussion that is gonna be moderated by uh, Vice President John Augustine. And let's see that one goes over there. All this right. one goes over here. That one goes over there. Okay. That one's got to be turned on. Okay. This one. That one's over here. I got to fight you for the mic. <laughs> If someone's talking on that side, you're going to be quiet. It, that'll automatically quiet you, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. Um, that one's got to be true. Okay. Okay. Now we're, we're on. Okay. Uh, we have originally had for our theme tonight uh, talking about refugee resettlement and the law from St. Cloud City Councilman Jeff Johnson who was unable to make it down here tonight due to the weather. But uh, these legislators have generously agreed to serve on a panel and we're gonna explore some of these issues in kind of more gen in a gen more general way of how to derail the racial ethnic spoil system in legislation. So uh, first of all, before just before we do that, I just wanted to, I feel like I wanna give a little bit of it uh, more specific in, uh, input on that refugee resettlement theme in that uh, Governor Walls uh, volunteered our state for 1,500 Afghan uh, refugees uh, last year. And uh, as we know, it was a very chaotic withdrawal, maybe not the best vetting process in the world. Uh, well, we, obviously, there are people that helped our, helped our country and served uh, uh, to fight uh, uh, for freedom and so forth that we don't want to abandon. But the local community should have some ins input on how much uh, refugees, how many refugees they're asked to absorb, and, and, and have some input on how that is done. And to a lot of, and it's a lot to a large extent, they don't get much input. And that's uh, what Councilman Johnson is going to talk to you about. In his eight years, he served on the St. Cloud City Council, and the impact he saw on the on the larger community and also on the academic community where. He taught in the state university system. Uh, so of this, they're not really uh, forthright on telling you 
uh, the local communities how many refugees are coming their way. Uh, so we, you kind of have to look through some left-leaning publications every once in a while to uh, where they brag about it. Uh, but uh, I know that Rochester has absorbed uh, 80 of them recently from the Afghan refugees from the Fort McCoy area. And they're still worried that that's not enough because it's, it's not enough to create a steady pipeline to get the established relationships uh, with the landlords for low-income low housing, whether it serves the greater community is, is a kind of a secondary concern, I guess. And then, um, so, and then you get, a, you, get, you get a lot of these uh, nonprofit organizations that are, that are uh, being uh, paid to uh, facilitate and, and uh, resettle the refugees, so they have a vested interest as well as having a steady pipeline because it's their job, right? So uh, as, as you find out with all kinds of uh, government aid to get these uh, perverse incentives. So um, I was reading a story about uh, in, in, in Savage Pace or Southwest Metro area uh, that they're building homes for 250 refugees. We don't really know exactly when they're coming or when they're being settled, but this organization called Alight. And, uh, They've got people that are helping welcome them. So there's a, a resident from who's uh, helping welcome them. That uh, is a, uh, came to the United States from Bangladesh in uh, 1977, and uh, what he what he does now is he serves on Savage's Race, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Task Force. And then we have uh, another gentleman from uh, Farmington. Uh, who was fled Cambodia in 1982, and, and you know there are many justifiable reasons to flee, flee Cambodia, and we can eat, and we need people. Uh, a lot of the great entrepreneurs in this country, you know, fled oppression and uh, came here for freedom. But he works in Prior Lake uh, Savage School District as a director of equity and inclusion. Uh, you know, we we need more skilled laborers. We need more. People, uh, uh, you know, manual blue collar laborers. I don't know that we need more bureaucrats. I'm just not. I'm just not convinced of that. So, uh, so. Uh, but anyway, so that just gives you a sense. And then there, there's a, there's also this, uh, the nonprofits. They try to resettle them, uh, uh, keep them close to each other. So, so and uh, whereas I think it's important to have. Uh, uh, gatherings and, and so forth, it's probably better to integrate refugees into the community if it's going to be uh, a viable uh, commu community uh, uh, situation long term. And so I'm by no means an expert on that, that's just from a cursory little bit of research. I'm sorry that Representative Je uh, Councilman Johnson couldn't make it here tonight, but we're going to be asking the uh, panel to d discuss this and a few other issues related to the racial, racial and ethnic spoiler system and legislation. And uh, I don't have a monopoly on possible questions here, so if you want to write something on the back of the program and, and uh, if I don't get to it, uh, I'll try to moderate something as well. But uh, first of all, I'll start out with the question for the panel. Uh, so in the state of Minnesota, we know that the refugee resettlement goes through the Department of Health human services who has oversight over those uh, resettlement programs and what should be done to uh, achieve greater transparency any legislator can start out with those. Right, i can i can jump in on uh, okay first of all yeah thanks um i just overall on the refugee resettlement programs in general um i've got a pretty strong opinion um i, I lived in minneapolis in uh would it be like late in the 90s and early 2000s uh, when the large amount of Somalis came over. And I rode, this, I rode the bus to work and I got to know a lot of Somalis and I listened to their stories. And it is amazing how oppressive, I mean, they broke into civil war, their country was in ruins. And every person that comes to this country, whether a refugee or an immigrant, they come here because they want less government. We have to, I mean, as conservatives, most immigrants should be conservative because they want freedom and opportunity, that's why they come here. Unfortunately, Democrats get in front of them and get them on programs and take them away from us. But um, 
The, the problem with the refugee resettlement program is we incentivize taking the, the upper crust of their society. If, if civil war broke out in this country and there was, a, there was an America somewhere else, the only people that would be able to go there are people with connections, the professors, the politicians, the lawyers, the wealthy people. So we've taken the best of those countries and taken them here and left them leaderless and uh, you know, ripe for terrorism and sudden takeover. So kind of object to this idea that refugees come here and permanently resettle. But the money that's paid to these refugees um, through these programs and paid through like Lutheran Social Services or whatever, they got like a hundred million dollars to resettle people. Um, that that's that's uh, reckless financially. And so I've, I've, I authored legislation that would basically create a, the, the money being paid to these people is a loan against their estate, much like when you, when you go on Medicaid, if you were to, it would, it would take your assets uh, in return. So it's a loan to those people. And the company that's, being, that's resettling them would basically be a co-signer on that loan. They have, a, they have a hook into them too. And then that gives those companies a financial incentive to ensure that they integrate into our society, get on their feet, start that catering business or small business or whatever they want to do, and get off of the social services. Because that's really the frustration in the community. It's that they come here, they get free, 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 free. We have no problem with people immigrating here and becoming productive members of society. But we need to uh, create an incentive to do that. And I think by putting it as a loan against their estate is, is one. Um, and then also making sure that stuff that's given to them is taxed. So it shows up as, you know, the freebies and we can actually ac accumulate that. But we have to hold these companies responsible that are assembly. They can't just dump them and get them on programs and leave. They need to get them to become uh, productive members of society. Anyone else before you? Do you represent Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now? No. Now? It's better without the microphone. Okay. Yeah, no. I'll try this. Okay. I think the question was who has oversight over the Health and Human Services, and and right now it's the it's the commissioner, but in reality is it is the legislature, because the legislature controls the purse. And we can't help what the federal government sends us. I've looked into that. They can they can send us who they want, and we're stuck with that. But but you know, I guess if you go back to the start, I'm old enough where I can remember a refugee uh, work always brought into the country. We would set up refugee camps or, or bring them into a country next to their uh, country that they were forced out of. So that when the, when the region stabilized, they would go back home, where a lot of them do like to be. They like to be back home. So we got screwed up in that area. But the other thing is the financing and, and the, the amount of money that we toss into our health and human services that some of us have been trying to cut back on. But, but it, then, then you're always under pressure from both sides. So you can't cut back on health and human services. But the fact is that you can. And if you want to get it under control, that's what you're going to have to do. And the oversight. Should be, that should be coming from our, our commissioners uh, and, and looking into how this money is being spent. Uh, we, because we've lost all our checks and balances in Minnesota, they're helping to promote the problem. And there's a difference between a refugee and an immigrant. And there are people that will immigrate to, immigrate to your country, but there's nothing wrong with when you get over, overpopulated with immigrants to say we need to slow down a bit. Because there was a time in this country, and I don't know the exact dates, but I believe it was somewhere in the 30s, maybe uh, all the way up into the 60s, where we ended immigration because we needed to assimilate the people that had come in. And so we need to start looking at that, but these are federal issues, and I don't want to get caught up in things that I don't have the power to change. But, but to answer the question, uh, we need to, we, we, the only way we're going to do it, unless we can get a new governor to put in new commissioners, and go back in and clean out these agencies, every one of them, and dig down deep and clean them out, then the only option is going to be the funding. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, you know, we're going to keep moving, so you know, I'm not going to have every legislator respond to each question. So, Okay, uh, secondly, uh, why are racial ethnic identity group criteria being allowed to proliferate into so much budget and policy legislation? So it is 
a truth of human history, but even more important, it is a biblical truth that unity brings strength. And then conversely, division results in weakness, right? Biblical truth. Can't argue with it. Law of the universe. And so, even our own Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God, out of many, one, right? Why is that stressed over and over and over throughout our culture and throughout our history? Because it's the truth. Because we as a country have been so strong when we are united with a common cause. And that common cause for most of our country's history has been the recognition of natural law that a creator exists and that our individual liberties flow from that creator. That's been our common cause. Recently, and when I mean recently, I mean last couple decades, we've seen a, a turn, turn of the tide. And now in our modern day, to answer the question, why are we seeing this stuff creep into the legislation? Because it's engineered to bring division. That's right. And when there's division, there's weakness. And there are those out here who are enemies of our way of life and our constitutional system that are waiting to attack us. But they know they can't attack us from the outside. They're waiting for us to corrupt internally. And that's exactly what's happening. When you see elements fostering the division in Minneapolis, when you see the flames of the buildings go up, there are those that are fanning the flames of the division and hatred because when we hate each other and we perceive our differences rather than looking past them, they are winning and our constitutional republic is losing. So that's the reason why there are those in the legislature that are pushing this poison into the various bills. Amen. Anyone else see a need to weigh in here on this one? Uh, Representative Biscoff? I don't know if this doesn't work. Maybe it can't. You know, uh, in the legislature, anyway, we, what we've seen, uh, and John, I think, covered it well earlier, um, the, uh, the critical race theory uh, resolution that was brought forward in July of 2020 uh, that said that uh, uh, it was a declaration that racism is a public health crisis. Actually, I'm running for the Senate against a woman who's a Republican who voted with the Democrats. So um, there's a bunch of fear uh, within a bunch of some of the legislators, uh, even on our side of the aisle, the Republican side of the aisle, uh, there were seven Republicans that voted with all the Democrats for that resolution. And as John pointed out, out of that came a whole study that, 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 that gave authority then to the Minnesota House to commission a study. They had a whole big report, and then they followed up. Now recently there was a report to the House Ways and Means Committee. There's a bunch of bills then that that legitimizes and brings forward. We actually saw those. Uh, one of our least favorite legislators, John Thompson, uh, brought a bill uh, in front of the State Government Finance Committee last year. And that bill would have taken $500 million of taxpayer money and divided it up into different groups, given it to different organizations, different groups, that everyone had to be a black group. And that's what the bill said. I called him out in committee and said, Representative Thompson, this is a racist bill. And I went through the definition of racism from the, from the dictionary for his benefit. And the bill hasn't been back. So, what we have to do, and I called out another legislator, the, the, the National Resources on of this bill also had racism in it, John, because um, I found it and called that out on the House floor. We need to get up and call out this racism when they do it. Because racism, as you said, does not cure racism. Amen. Uh, very well said. Just like the resolutions uh, that pass and then all of a sudden they're given extra weight uh, uh, so it's not just harmless to pass a feel-good resolution. 
Uh, we also have uh, all these uh, task forces. So how do we, it seems like when these task forces are supposed to be convened outside of session or between sessions or something, uh, populated with various uh, identity group members and so forth that that uh, that what comes back is oftentimes very close to what ends up being in the final bill that they, they just kind of defer to whatever recommendations of the task force there is. So how do we weaken the influence of stakeholder and identity group task forces? That's perfect. No. <laughs> when it was set that when every time it gets set down, it's picking up the echo. Well, I shut it off, so we're good. Hopefully, except you just turn it on and get that work. It, it works fine as long as it doesn't get set down. Okay. Is it working? No, it's not turned on. I don't need it. Okay. Okay. Ta task forces, like uh, like a lot of other like a lot of other things that we see that are put together by, uh, by the groups of people that are trying to move an agenda. So the only way you're gonna get rid of these task force, uh, task force committees or whatever you wanna call them is to elect people that just aren't gonna put them into place. And, and right now we have, in every bill, you'll see the, the ethnic uh, studies, ethnic, uh, I guess they call it justice. Everything is justice, whether it's environmental justice, this justice, that justice. It's, it's put in every bill. Justice it's, doesn't need a modifier. By the no, way. it doesn't. But all you do is take it out. And it's gotten so bad that uh, anybody who wants money, and there's a lot of people that want money, believe me, I get it every day. Oh, did that mean I need money for X, Y, and Z? And every one of them has plugged in there something to do with uh, justice. Whether it be, uh, well, even, even in the legacy bill, uh, the, every every uh, agency, DNR, will put in there, and there's a question, what are you going to do for environmental justice? And a lot of times it's just such nonsense, and they put it in there so that it looks good so they get their money. So we have shallow legislators who bring this stuff forward to try to appease both their uh, uh, constituents and also their own fragile ego, I guess. <laughs> And, and so it's just a matter of getting people elected that just aren't going to put those things in. Because right now we don't have the, the house. And just to give you an idea, uh, in the last couple of years, I have not even had a bill heard. I, I, I've, I've requested hearings on over, probably over 30 bills, never got one. So it's, it's been put into place. All these things are in place. The only way to get rid of them is to get rid of the current leadership. Hey, I, sorry. I wanted to say one thing on task forces too. Um, the whole idea of a task force is to create a distraction for the public so that legislators don't have to do their job. You come to us and you say, hey, we need to fix this, and a legislator, I don't want to do anything. Uh, well, let's create a task force, and then we'll appoint people to that task force in an exact 50-50 proportion of people who agree and disagree, and we'll just let it go. Because they look up with no solution. That's the whole purpose of a task force, is distraction. Okay, thank you. Next question. Uh, we talked about the nonsense uh, that comes up with all these uh, environmental justice and so forth. Uh, another nonsense example, uh, I'd like to hear from Representative Grassel on this and also maybe some others. How can we get rid of the nonsense of implicit bias training requirements? Implicit bias training. I think you've probably experienced that. <laughs> <laughs> one thing I one thing I learned growing up was when you get told to do something, just make sure you do it. Leave the it speaking leave it in the trainer. Home. Leave it in the home. Um, it, this implicit bias training program. Uh, that's that's assuming that uh, that's telling people, or you're biased, you just don't know it, and, and that is a crock of garbage. Again, again. It is there to cause division. That is all it's that, that is all it's for, to cause division. 
and in order to get rid of it, I mean, everybody up here is in agreement to get rid of that that kind of garbage. We need it. We need a house cleaning from the top, from top to bottom. We need a change of, of administration at the top. We need to take back control of the house. We need to take back control of the Senate. And the, the ones who are wobbly need uh, right now, who uh, who tend might tend to lean towards, uh, okay, we'll we'll do this. We'll do this. We we don't want to we don't want to have this fight right now. When they have voices like ours, and we have a majority, it'll strengthen their needs as well. I mean, to help those who are weak. It, where, where did I read that before? Oh, I, I think I've read it in the Bible a time or, or a time or so. You know, so to have somebody tell me that I'm biased and I I, I just don't realize it. You know, I know how my mom and dad raised me up, and that we're all to break our society down. Uh, in, in multiple different ways to where we turn away from God. They want to demonize religion. They want to demonize your law enforcement. There is no implicit bias, folks. That's all a fabrication in their minds to drive their agenda. Can I say something here? I don't, want to, I don't want to belabor this, but this is a story that I just have to tell. We had to take the, this bias training, and I know some people didn't show up, but that's fine. <laughs> in, in this training, uh, some, one of our members made a comment about we sit here, we're sitting here and we're, we're eating each other up like cannibals. And one of the new posse caucus people that were there broke out in tears. And she said, you can't say that because some of us are descendants of cannibals and that's offensive. <laughs> that's, that's no lie. And, and one of the Democrats' senior members made the comment that said, our so-called founding fathers. But this is who we're dealing with, all right? So, so I, get really, I get a little bit upset sometimes. And that's, it, I guess I get upset sometimes. But anyway, when people come to me and say, why don't you get along? And there's sometimes when you have to make a stand and say no. There's no getting along with, with this kind of thinking. And it's, it's, like, it's like the one member who was offended because we wanted to make uh, Blaze Pink uh, available for women that wanted to hunt, and she was offended by the color pink. So. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna try not to take the microphone out of the stand. You can take it out of the stand. Just. Okay, a uh, question regarding elections. Uh, we've heard play other uh, liberal places, or very radical places in the country are now uh, thinking about letting non-citizens and felons not done with their sentences vote in local elections. And we saw that even in one major party here this year within their precinct caucuses. Uh, would local communities be able to let non-citizens or felons not done with sentences vote in local elections under our current government and would any particular legislation be helpful in this regard? I mean cities, cities under current law cities can let uh, people vote in their elections however they designate uh, or no they was it in the caucuses they can right uh, but not in the elections. The problem is that we're just confusing people you're casting doubt and or you're you're training people to get used to non-citizens or uh and, and people who are even here without permission to to vote in elections uh, but we should be we should be enforcing this across everything including caucuses which which are basically a private organization but um it's it's creating it's training people to get used to non-citizens voting the same thing with uh, issuing id cards and stuff with, to, to non-citizens but if, I think it's legislatively, we should be able to fix it. As long as you have a warrant for arrest, you should be able to do it. Okay. okay. Uh, next, uh, what can be done to prevent revolutionary leftist overhaul of social studies standards in education? School choice. School choice. Okay. That was quick. Yeah. I'll, 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 what were you going to do? I don't want to cut you off. You, you, just, you just said school choices or something else. You wanted to... Okay. Yeah. The, the one thing that, uh, that I think we need to be really careful of is 
to have the, the state or any government do what the liberals do and come in and start, start giving us do's and don'ts of, of what we can do with our children. We have to continue to empower the people and hopefully get them to take over our school boards. I know that one of the, one of the districts, uh, school districts where I live, uh, read, the, read the history books uh, and didn't like them. And it took them, well, not even one year, and, and they got those school books pulled and were able to get their own history books in. So people have to start taking responsibility for themselves and stop come running to the government and saying, can you fix this for me? They're your kids, they're your grandkids. The schools belong to you. And if every time we give more authority to a state to say we can and can't do this, we're shooting ourselves in the foot. We really are. Because if this, we have unalienable rights given to us by God. If we start accepting the notion that these rights are coming from the government, I guarantee you they're going to be taken away. Amen. I'll add a couple of remarks here. So take the different areas of the standards for our K-12 system in Minnesota law. One of them is math, the math standards. One of them was just mentioned, the social study standards, and there are others. What you may not understand is that we as the legislature have already ceded our authority and given it to the executive branch. Yep. And what's happening is these, every 10 years, these different areas of the, the, the curriculum are reviewed and updated. Yep. And so right now, this is the year for the social studies standards update. It's 10 year update. That's why this is part of the conversation right now. Last couple of years, there was a different area. In the next couple of years, it'll be a different area. But every 10 years, and a different area is, is up for review. And so we as a legislature, we can't do anything right now because we've already ceded our authority to the, leg to the executive branch, and this stuff is happening and doesn't require our additional approval. That's the problem. So we don't have the ability to stop it unless you get consensus from both bodies and then signed by the governor to stop it. Right? That's the problem. So to answer the question, we have to stop it by, by uh, getting a uh, uh, change in the law. Okay, but there's, there's another thing that I want to submit to this. Parent groups have organized, I've been speaking around the state to these various parent groups. Another conversation we had at our table was, it's an amazing sight to witness on different topics, different organic groups springing up in these last couple years. On the topics of you know moms uh, for liberty, uh, education is another one. Uh, education topics, medical freedom is another area where people are just banding together and rising up. And as I've been speaking for years, I've been saying the following statement in regards to education: Let's return meaning to the word "independent" in independent school districts, right? Because what's happened is here's I mentioned earlier. A biblical principle. Here's another biblical principle. The borrower is, is what? Servant to the lender. Slave to the lender. lender. So how does that biblical truth, that universal truth, play out today? Because you see the federal government dangling things to the states with money and then strings are attached. And when those states accept that money, what happens? We have voluntarily shackled ourselves and become slaves to the federal government. The exact same thing is being replicated at the state level to the school district level. Right? I, I went to school, public school, independent school district. But it's in, you know, we, you hear the name Rhino, Republican in name only. Independent in name only is what's happened. They're no longer independent because these school districts, the state is dangling these dollars over, and these school districts, there's 330 or so across the state uh, of public school systems, have become slaves to the lender, which is the state. That's the reason why school boards, they're essentially rubber stamps for what the Minnesota Department of Education deems them to do through the rulemaking authority that the legislature has ceded their authority and given to the executive branch. It's, it's disgusting and angry. Would it shock anybody that I have high blood pressure? 
<laughs> I have high blood pressure, and the blood pressure medication doesn't really do anything. It drops at about 10 points, which is still... After I take the blood pressure medication, I'm at 140 over 90. So, it's so angering what's happening. So frustrating. But the answer is, we need to take back the power. And these school districts, and we as a state, we need to reject this money that the federal government continues to, to give out, which is what's causing the inflation that we're all uh, witnessing today. But again, this just goes on and on, so thank you. School choice. Uh, Take your kids out of the public. Do it again. <laughs> you can, it, it was that mic burped. That was this one. That okay. Mic. All right, I stand corrected then. You didn't do anything wrong. Okay. You're fine. <laughs> Folks, everything you've heard up here, it has been going on for decades. Yes, right. It has right. been it has been a movement uh, since since communist communism was birthed. And it's infiltrated. And they knew they, they have known all along that in, in a, uh, a a combat type war, they will not defeat the United States. So what do they do? Infiltrate. And bit by bit, as people have come out of come out of the colleges, they are now the ones teaching. Okay? This has been decades. So to think that this is a one bill or two bill or one session or two session fix, it's going to take some time to take back what we have let go. And we have been we have been complicit in this as well as far as letting this evil creep up onto our doorstep. We have been politically corrected to death and we've allowed it. So just like everybody in this room, I say enough and no more. We have to take it back, but it's gonna be a long fight. Okay, okay, thank you. Just wanted to very briefly add, in addition to the funding, uh, as far as the dependency, we, we see the dependency when it comes to regulations. All these school districts that have had uh, uh, different regulations regarding uh, uh, masking and uh, the pushing for the vaccines to the lower, COVID vaccines to lower and lower risk uh, younger age groups is a direct consequence of the guidance and the decision trees issued by the Minnesota Department of Health and as some of you, we just finally got rid of masking in, in my kids' school, and uh, but we still have to wear masks on the school bus because that comes from the U.S. Department of Transportation regulation for busing. So it's not just it's not just uh, the money; it's also the regulations as well. Uh, kind of an outgrowth of the last question, and we only have about one or two more, and then we're going to be wrapping up here. Uh, so how uh, do we defund the pernicious racial ethnic identity group ideology in our universities, public schools, and healthcare facilities? I don't want to hog the microphone, but I'll take that one. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, we're going to need that. We're going to need. Well, you got 20 years to make up for for Northern Minnesota, right? So. Yeah, that's right. Once again, we're going to need the majority. But what we do. Uh, in our in our education funding is drives me up the wall and it's because we never the legislature even though I like a hands-off I don't like dumping money into uh, education Minnesota because that's basically what we're doing we pour this money into the colleges and say here you go and there's no oversight as to where this money goes and so now we it, 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 I'm not gonna go into all of it but we see things in our colleges and they talk about the tuition and we've got uh, professors in our colleges that write their own textbooks, and they change them every year or so, so every single class has to buy a new book. And, and it goes on and on and on. So what we need to do is start taking this money as a legislature and say, the universities, you're going to get X, but here's the thing. We have way more people uh, that are going to get jobs if we get them into technical colleges. So we're going to start funneling this money into technical colleges, we also need to go, go into the high schools, and some of this higher ed money needs to be transferred into technical classes within our high schools, and all the way actually down to like the seventh and eighth grade in the junior high. 
because we've got kids coming out of these, these schools that don't know where they want to go. We shove them into a four-year college. They may or may not finish that four-year college. They come out with, with maybe a degree, maybe not, but none of them know anything. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. if we had, if we had uh, the, these technical classes in the school, like when I was a kid, you could, you could have these kids working on, on whatever it is, whether it be automobiles all the way up to robotics. And, and then I think, I think, and I've talked with law enforcement on this too, we would see a decrease in juvenile crime because kids would, would have self-respect and they would have a, a something to do besides staring at a computer or going out and causing trouble. But we need to take control of that money for higher ed and just stop saying, here you go. And that, that means bringing down Education Minnesota, but I think we're up for that pretty soon here, too. Yeah, the Omnibus Health and Human Services Bill that I referred to in my earlier talk about the quotas for good wives and doulas, the, the ones that are supposed to implement to develop the model for curriculum for uh, promoting racial, ethnic, and language diversity in the midwife and doula workforce. It comes from the U of M School of Public Health Center for Anti-Racism Research for Health Equity. That's something we can try to uh, defund, I think. Okay, uh, the last question I've got here is from the audience. It's not necessarily related to the topic, but it is important, uh, so I do want to give it some weight here. Uh, we got through this uh, pandemic state of emergency. We have this giant budget reserve. So it rained on a lot of people during this uh, uh, lockdown state of emergency, but we didn't use the rigging day fund at all. It's pretty much, it's still very large in addition to the regular budget surplus. So, if what can we do with regard to this budget reserve? Uh, how, how do we how do we get it down to a reasonable limit? So, just to provide a little perspective, uh, they talk about seven point seven billion dollars, right? Uh, of over collection of, okay. They talk about $7.7 .7 billion of over collection of people's money. By the way, the, the uh, February forecast is coming out Monday next week. So that's actually the number that we will use uh, for, for going forward uh, for the rest of this, uh, this session. Uh, on top of that, over the last two months, uh, since the November forecast that forecasted $7.7 .7 billion, another $1.4 billion more is 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 being realized between then and now add on to that the 2.6 billion dollar a budget reserve that was pointed out where are we 12 billion dollars of over collection of people's money uh, that's sitting there in st paul uh, back to the question though uh, the democrats have over time so the way the policy reads right now is that when you get to the november forecast uh, there's some, some numbers in there that say uh, you have to take, what was it, is it 30 percent? It's 30 percent of under law. You need to take 30 percent of that surplus, if there's a surplus, and then it automatically, MMB automatically has to put it into the budget reserve. Right at that point. Automatically. Keeps grabbing one every time there's a surplus. Another 30 percent of that surplus goes in that budget reserve. And they keep, they keep in law. Uh, increasing that number and I've increased it over the last several years so the Democrats want to squirrel away uh, the people's money at any chance they can so you know the answer is we have to get control of the House and the Senate and the governor we actually have to have a conservative governor uh, I hope one of these uh, candidates we have uh, steel sharp and steel and we get somebody who really steps forward and is going to do us well uh, and gets elected wins and does uh, with us what we need to do, and that is, that money needs to go back to the people. Yeah. 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 Okay, I, wanna, I wanna just talk about the budget reserve itself, not the dollar amount, I mean, we all wanna give it back. Um, and it was a Republican that brought forward legislation to require a budget reserve, but I, I wanna talk about just, just two scenarios. If the, if the Republicans aren't in control, and we have a deficit, what are the Democrats gonna do? They're gonna raise taxes. And if we're in a deficit under Republican control, what are the Republicans going to do? Raise taxes. But we should be cutting spending, right? That's what we should do. The problem is, is when we have a budget reserve with billions of dollars in it, when whenever there's a shortfall, Republicans will never cut spending. They'll just dig into the pile. And so we, we with a budget reserve, like you deserve to have a budget reserve in your family, but the government doesn't. 
because we need a deficit to actually force us to cut spending. And if we have this budget reserve, it won't happen. That's why I've always said we should not have a rainy day fund. We should go through tough times and cut spending. Otherwise, budget, if we have a surplus, we grow government. And even in a deficit, we don't do anything but maintain, maybe grow a little bit. Okay, and then just one final survey of the legislators here. Uh, how are they personally impacted by redistricting? Uh, do they have to get redistricted with other legislators? Are they uh, seeing any primary challenges and so forth? I guess we just let them weigh in on that very briefly, and then we'll uh, close out the uh, event here. I want to mention something too on the last topic, John. Um, 72 billion dollars is the number we learned about from the Senate hearing last week. $72 billion of federal money that has flowed into Minnesota around the notion of COVID. $72 billion with a B. That's like almost one and a half times our biennial general fund budget amount right there. $52 billion is that amount. That's how much has come in. We wonder why inflation is going on. We wonder why people are in their basement with their pajamas on. Um, we have to we have to change course. But to your question, John, um, I am going to be running for the Minnesota Senate. Uh, redistricting didn't really affect me, other than my district, the Senate district, and the House district got more conservative, and uh, I'm going to win. Hey. <laughs> Politicians. Who <laughs> just answer the question? <laughs> Me neither. No, it's just yeah, kidding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I mean, I'm, I've been there for ten years, and so I've, I've uh, been coming a little, becoming a little more uncomfortable every year because I, I don't believe people should be there forever. And so I made up my mind uh, when, uh, when, when I knew the lines were coming out that if I was paired with anybody else, I just wasn't going to run. And, and so when, when the, when the lines came out. And I was paired with someone uh, uh, over in another county. And I just kind of said, well, that's it. And then I started looking at the map, and it turns out that they, it was an open Senate seat. So I called my wife, and I said, what do you think? And she said, go for it. You don't have to come home. <laughs> but, but anyway, so I, I like uh, Senator, uh, future Senator Biskowski. I will be running for the Senate. Uh, I uh, I look forward to if I win. I mean, I, I don't take anything for granted. It's it's kind of an iffy area. It's, it it pulled good for our President Trump, but uh, it's going to be work. But I'm going to do it. I have, I'm confident that uh, if we can take that seat, I think we can make some big gains in the Senate. Uh, push for the conservative values, and that's uh, kind of my plan. I will still be representing uh, District 2A, and that's right in the north, north central area from Lake of the Woods County down <coughs> to Beltrami County. And it didn't change my district a whole lot other than it made it, it made it geographically smaller, but I picked up the city of Bemidji and the college there. <coughs> and I lost a couple of areas that were pretty, were pretty red. But I'm really not too concerned about it because during the riots, uh, myself and several other people went to the city uh, of Bemidji to help protect their, their businesses from uh, busloads of rioters that were planning to come and burn businesses there as well. <coughs> and the mayor of Bemidji at that time called us a bunch of vigilantes. So she helped us out a lot. <laughs> I was very appreciative. <laughs> then she ran for Senate and lost against Justin Nycorp, which was nice. It just added insult to injury. <laughs> Uh, as far as the college goes, uh, people say you, you, a lot of times you have a little bit of trouble with those. I did a, a two, uh, not this last election uh, season, but the one before that, they did an uh, interview with, for the student uh, television, student body. And the young man that came to do the interview, quite liberal. Yeah, but by the time he got down and asked me the questions, was putting his equipment away, he kept looking at me. And I said, do you have more questions, young man? He goes, no. But if I were in your district, I'd be voting for you. Wow. He said, he said, I've never heard from that perspective. And so uh, 
a couple months later, he sent me a card saying thank you again. He said that after my interview had aired for the student body, he had never gotten so many requests for more information about a candidate. So those young people, all they're lacking is the perspective coming from somebody who's going to tell them the truth and not sugarcoat things. Yeah, as, as I said before, uh, well, my wife and I had talked about actually before redistricting came out that I'm not going to run again. So um, I, the the district was changed to uh, it did, did have somebody in my district and uh, two senators in my district. So. Uh, uh, Senator Rosen retired, and and, uh, and I announced my retirement uh, last weekend. So, and I want to thank my wife for putting up with this for four years, and my treasurer is back here, Andrew Schmidt. So, uh, it's been uh, I, I've run I think I've run five campaigns in four years because I've had a special special primary, uh, another general election, and uh, another primary uh, last two years ago, and then another general election. So. It's, it's crazy, and uh, campaigning is just really draining. Well, I am in the Albertville, St. Michael area, and I think that most up here, probably every single one of us up here agree unanimously that I live in the best district in the state, <laughs> in Albertville, St. Michael. And so it just shrunk, there was such a great population growth, it shrunk just a little bit. Uh, and. But again, as I already mentioned, there was an open Senate district, so I am running for Senate. Looking forward to that. Uh, the first order of business, Senator Dreskowski, um, change the dress code in the Senate. Just tighten it up a little bit so that this isn't allowed. Thank you all for coming tonight. I should have probably done this earlier when they were here, but uh, Joan from the Jimmy's Event Center, who uh, supervised the catering tonight, and uh, uh, Jennifer, kind of, who uh, was the events uh, manager, were very helpful.